Hi, everyone. Welcome to this evening's program. Um, it is just one of the many things that we have going on here at Glenview Community Ch Church, even during these difficult times. Whether you want to deepen your faith, find a group of people for fellowship, love music, or are looking for a great children's church school program, or just want to share God's love by helping others through mission and outreach work, you can find your community here at GCC. We follow in the way of Jesus. Glenview Community Church is a community that celebrates all God's children. You can find out more about our community on our website. I also invite you to speak to, with me or our senior pastor, Chuck Mize, or our membership liaison, CJ Soltz, who is letting people in the program as we speak. Um, contact information can be found on our website. And I wanna to introduce Tom Aldrich, who is going to introduce our tonight's program and is our speakers forum co-chair with Peter. So thank you for all the work that you do. Tom? Thanks, Elizabeth, and welcome, everybody. It's great to see all of you tonight. And uh, welcome. Tom McGuire's to on the call. Yep. C speakers forum. Um, I would ask everybody to please mute yourself. Uh, or maybe, Elizabeth, you can mute folks. And at the end of uh, the program, you'll have an opportunity to ask Yvonne questions either by using the chat function or by raising your hand. Uh, it's our extreme pleasure to welcome tonight Yvonne Wolf, who is a facilitator, educator, and trainer in intercultural competence in Chinese culture. As a native Chinese Mandarin speaker uh, based in the Chicago area, she will guide us in the background of Confucius life and times, his name and meaning, common misinterpretations, and cultural misunderstandings in communications with East Asian people. And hopefully by the end of the evening, we'll have a better understanding not only of Confucius, but of interactions with Chinese culture and Chinese people and other East Asian people. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening. And again, please mute yourself and hold your questions to the end, either by chat or raise your hand and welcome to our speaker, Yvonne Wolf. Yvonne? Thank you very much, Tom. <clears throat> yes, I would like to take the questions in the end. I'm just very glad to be here. <clears throat> I am a Glenview resident for 10 years now. I came from Los Angeles, <clears throat> and Glenview has been such a wonderful, welcoming community. I've been very fortunate to have some of my neighbors out there watching me, I'm sure. Uh, <clears throat> so tonight, I want to present Confucius as a key to overcoming cultural misunderstandings. I think the best way to start is by explaining a, a cultural misunderstanding that I grew up with when I, when my parents decided to send me to a Catholic girls school in my middle school. Now they chose that decision in Los Angeles because for them it was a culturally familiar setting that by middle school and high school, that's the time that in China, in Taiwan, in Japan, in Korea, many students would be separated from um, like a single sex education. So that was the system which they're familiar with and they found that to be most conducive to learning because you're not distracted in those early prepubescent pu and um, those growing years by the opposite sex. Okay, so my parents sent me to a Catholic girls school, a convent actually, where half of the faculty were nuns. Now this is where the cultural misunderstanding happened. Where my parents chose that system of education because they prioritized education, they wanted us to go to a competitive school, and number two, it was single sex. The religious part, they didn't really think it was, it was a good thing, they, but they had no particular uh, drive for the religious part. <clears throat> But the misunderstanding happened when I started school and the religious classes I had when my um, non teachers uh, realized that she, they would ask me that, have you read the New Testament? I said, no. And they were absolutely 
mortified. They were so shocked and they felt genuinely bad for me. So they <laughs> assigned me to read the New Testament and with their guidance that we should go through chapter by chapter. At the time, <laughs> as a middle schooler, I wanted to do anything to please my teachers, but also at the same time, I was a little begrudging this because I feel like, what am I missing in my life? You know, why do I need to catch up? But as a also English learner, I was very eager to and you accustom also to the idea of catching up to education. But as I grew up, I realized that there was this cultural misunderstanding. The, the non-teachers were obviously trying to help me obtain a religious education they thought we were there primarily for. From their perspective, from the questions they asked me, I realized that they have no idea what Chinese people were and what kind of moral upbringing we would have if we didn't believe in Christ or we didn't have a Christian upbringing. And I realized now that how would they know? How would they know? Uh, how would they understand the what makes what is the uh, moral, um, uh, let's say, center for Chinese people, and how would they even guess what that world looks like? So, with those questions, I am here to to bridge that understanding. And even here, you know, I have friends who met me and then during Christmas, maybe it's the first year we, um, they know me from uh, spending Christmas and they will ask me, I'm not sure, am I supposed, can I say Merry Christmas to you um, or Happy Holidays? And I say, of course, Merry Christmas, uh, <laughs> because we love Christmas just as much. My family definitely celebrates Christmas. But it's not a, it doesn't um, offend my, <laughs> my beliefs system. And also on top of that, if you say happy holidays, well, Lunar New Year's, we just passed in, in February. You know, saying that in December is way too early. So I wouldn't know what holiday you meant. So I'm going to start just with a, sharing a, a little screen so that you know you're in the right place. And then, I'm going to stop sharing when, um, when I, let me see, when appropriate. Okay. So, so, um, so, so that's why I feel like that um, Confucius is a big beginning point, a key to overcoming cultural misunderstanding. If, if I can communicate to you a little background on Confucius and what this person has influenced many countries in East Asia outside of China, then I think you will have a better understanding of how to approach people from East Asia. Okay, now, so, so this is how I'm going to start with just four points. Now, these four points are going to be highlighted for the section I'm in. So name, so I'm going to first start with Confucius' name, and then we'll go into the time and place. Now, these things sound like very simple, you know, very um, Wikipedia style, and that's, I think that's the best way we can get to know someone. This picture you see is at a Confucius temple, and uh, we will. And so, Confucius temples are um, there are quite a few of them in Taiwan, in China, in many East Asian countries. So, first of all, his name. Hear a little echo. So, his name, what does Confucius mean? Now, some people, yes, and this is a common uh, misunderstanding again, so many times that you might hear, well, I might have, uh, I have heard many times of Confucius um, as a, um, used as a pun for confusion and um, being confused, and it has actually nothing to do with that. And so that is um, a pun that makes sense perhaps in English, but from the, for, if I'm using my Chinese brain, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and that's also because Confucius has a position in, in East Asian society in such a high, really revered um, place that any kind of jokes just seems odd and unfamiliar to our 
treatment of that person. So I'm going to, so Confucius is actually a Latinized version of his name that Chinese people refer to him as, but it's not really his name. In fact, we don't use his first name at all in common practice because that in itself is a sign of disrespect. So I'm going to show you this slide again. This Latin form was Confucius, and it's actually started with Kong as his last name, just as we have maybe heard of, you have heard of Mao Zedong as Mao being the last name first, and Kong is his last name. And Fu Zi, Fu Zi, Confucius Fu Zi, that part is actually the title as like a senior grandmaster like in Black Belt. Okay, if you have heard of sensei and using Japanese, it's the same type of honorific. So it's a title. We don't even call him by first and last name. So he is like the Grand Master Kong. And that's what we are actually saying when we call him Confucius. So this is one thing that is in much of Chinese practice. And it's we are brought up with his name in school in many famous proverbs. And he is so much embedded in the school education that there is almost like we're, it's a subconscious and an unconscious um, uh, the system that that he is part of. Now, so so it's just the name. I think it deserves some uh, understanding of what we where he is in East Asian society. And then we want to talk about, I just want to give you a little background in the time and place. Now, this could be a little confusing because time, time as we know it, is a hard, difficult marker. It's very conceptualized because once a year, now that we've spent almost a year uh, quarantined or at home, and what is five years, right? So when we think of time, it is kind of hard to understand time for China. Okay, for example, Chinese culture often discusses a history of recorded history of 5,000 years. Now 5,000, what does that feel like? It's very hard to understand what 5,000 is like. We know the 2000 millennium that we are familiar with now that we are in 2021. Well, just add another 3000 to that um, BCE, before common era. Again, what does that look like? So it's very hard for most of us to imagine that. Just like when we think of the earth as being 4.5 billion years old and the um, dinosaurs being only 65 million years ago, I know it's a long time, but it's very hard for me <laughs> to tell you what's the difference between millions and billions because it's just so old and so long that I lose that sense of time. So help you to, to help you understand the sense of time for this 5,000 years, I want to give you some visuals. And the point of understanding time is that I want you to understand that most of our understanding, common understanding, school book education about China, many times is just starting in the 20th century. There's a little bit before communism, and then my kids are learning about China in this post-communist uh, um, era. And to me, that's like looking at a, a picture or a whole room through a keyhole. Okay, you really can't use that to understand China. It's not even how Chinese people here in America understand ourselves. Many Chinese immigrants and Chinese Americans who have been here two, three generations were way before communism. So how do we identify ourselves? It is not useful to just understand communism. So let me help you understand what this concept of time is. So what does that 5,000 years look like? Okay, you, you can go through all these dynasties and it's going to be very confusing because Chinese dynasties, some of them have names that sound so similar, it's very confusing. But what I can tell you that let's look at the big eras, the big chunks. 
So first we have the 2000 years, the two millennia from here to back to the zero, right? And then before that, we have that 3000 years of BCE. Okay, and then this is what I divided as an imperial, imperial meaning when we had emperors. And then before that is pre-imperial. Is that pre-imperial? I hear echoes, sorry. The pre-imperial is a time before China had single emperors. Now, we're not going to discuss whether imperials are good or bad because that's a whole different presentation. But I do want to show you that when the monarchy, the Chinese imperial system ended in 1911 to now, it's about 100 years or a little bit over 100 years. And that post-imperial time is really only a sliver of Chinese identity or Chinese government system. Okay, so what is that? So if I put in a pie chart, look at that. That is really the red part, 20th century to now, 21st century, is really just a sliver, sliver of Chinese history. So if we want to understand China, that little part is not going to give us the answers. Confucius is a person who was born before the yellow part. Okay, so it's right in the beginning of that, the, or the between the yellow and the blue part. Okay, so he's on the end of that blue part that went to yellow. So that's how long he's been around for Chinese people. So now, even better way, which I've seen people do uh, when they are explaining um, the, the earth or the uh, life forms on earth, right? How do we put the protozoans, you know, to humans, you know, within one 24 hours? I thought that could be useful for our understanding of time as well. So if we were to put 5,000 years into one 24 hour period, okay, and that means we are now standing at 11.59, that, um, the 11.59 p.m. And then the beginning of Chinese history would be um, the, yes, 12 a.m. Well, from the previous day, right? So then when would have, when, where would we put Confucius? Confucius would have arrived in Chinese history at 11.30 a.m. So it's a long time ago, it's half a day ago. You see that? So I hope that is a little helpful to you. And in the 20th century, we are that close, right? Confucius lived during 11.30 a.m. Okay, so that time is, you know, half a day away from us. And what does that time look like, right? Now we have to look at, now we just want to understand how far he was, right? A half a day ago. And then now I want to show you what that place looked like. China, as we know, it looks like the green map. This looked like a Mickey Mouse with two years, right? But China was not like that in his time. China was a place with many kingdoms and many people different people of different languages, different writing languages of different, many different gods and practices. They ate different foods. They had different uh, social structure. And Confucius came from a time of that time, was of that kind of um, cultural and political diversity that we do not think of China right now. So he is from this part of China. So that remember that uh, that if we to cut that Chinese map in half, the right side of that Mickey Mouse ear, and then to, in that far corner, okay, where and that's those are the countries that are considered Chinese, which is and became the Han people. So those little kingdoms were fighting all the time. They hated each other. Chinese, they did not uh, live peacefully with each other. In fact, many times 
with their call, the time that he was born is called the warring times or warring period. And that warring period is all these countries, nations fighting each other, killing each other. There was no particular law or order. And you see the brown part on the right, that is the part where he's from. And he was a, he was a person who had a very revolutionary thought. And at this time, we have already, in our current time, we already accepted many of Confucius rules and principles and philosophy. But in his time, he was very revolutionary because he was suggesting something that was totally unheard of. And what is that? He really believed that, first of all, emperors should respect human lives, that even though kings and kingdoms can send tens and thousands of soldiers to their death, that, that the kings should respect those lives. That means if, he, if the kings can use those lives in a better way that would spare their lives, then they would be a stronger nation. He, and another thing he was proposing was that we should have the system of loyalty. And this system of loyalty means that the kings would be just as loyal in that sense to preserving the lives of his people as his soldiers respected him. If the soldiers are there to save his life, then he should think of their lives as valuable. So this mutual respect, this social order is spread into all levels of society, and which means that then his noble people will support him and the king will support his noble people. Okay, so then how about family? Within the family that the father would take care of the wife and the wife would also respect the husband. When it comes to older brother and younger brother, younger brother would, re would respect the opinion of the first brother, the older brother, and the older brother would protect the younger brother. So this kind of a mutual relationship, mutual respect is what Confucius suggested. Now, this is a time where might is right. I think of medieval times. Think of the time that people just walk by and they didn't, they had a horse and you wanted a horse, you just kill them off, okay? This was China. This is a time where all these kingdoms despise each other, constantly fighting, pillaging, raiding each other. And, and Confucius was telling their kings, he was traveling from one kingdom to another and said, you really shouldn't do that. <laughs> and he was suggesting to them that if you stop fighting, you can actually maintain your current position longer because then you're not worried about your brother killing you or your uncle going to behead you for the throne, right? If you just value your relationships with people, when your society, your clan, and take care of your wives, okay, then you can actually prolong your own legacy. Now, this idea was very, was looked upon with a lot of skepticism. So all these kings, you know, from one area to another said, God, if I, if I don't kill my neighbor, he's going to kill me. So it was a hard pill or hard lesson to swallow. But Confucius, what he did was that in his teachings is that he did propose these what he called a correct relationship between social groups. And this is what actually created uh, the foundation of many of Chinese laws, Japanese laws, Korean laws. Many of these uh, countries founded their legal system based on Confucius beliefs. Now, Confucius principles and his teachings. Now, not only that, but the education system, the um, social interactions, and um, how you do business. All these things have something to do with the principles that Confucius was teaching. Now, well, I like you to 
understand is also, okay, now where is he from? And I want to give you a little idea of this place in Shandong is called Chufu. And it's pronounced with a Q, it's hard to pronounce that. This is a pinyin spelling and it is called Chufu. And this is near, well, let me see, can you see Beijing on there? Okay, if you can see Beijing, you can see that Chufu is south of Beijing and north of Shanghai. I know there are some friends out there who have been fortunate enough to have traveled to China, so I want to make sure that you have that kind of basis. So that's what the kingdom looks like now, what part of this, this more uniform China. So now I um, I've give you some of these ideas about Confucius, but I think a best way to understand this person was that he um, he had he lived and he died and he was uh, rather a um, lived a long life for someone of Chinese uh, that time and he had a profound, profound influence. And his um, philosophy is, is really what we're going to talk about after this section. So I think this video is very useful. So I'm going to play this video. Oops. Okay. Oops. If you let me know if you can, you can hear this. Is everyone can hear this all right? It's not started. Okay, can you hear it? Oh, okay, let me... No, we can't hear it. Okay. Let's see. We tried it before, it was fine. Let me try here. Okay, let me try it here. How about that? Most people recognize his name. And know that can you hear that? Not very well. If you turn up the volume, maybe. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Oh, it is on highest. Okay. Let me try yeah. again. Okay. Sharing is pause. Bring your share window to the front. Most people recognize his name. Can you hear that? Not very well. Do you want to send me the link or do you want to? Yes. Let's do that. Okay. Are you going to email it to me? Yes. Just one moment. I will send it to you. I don't have it yet. I'm I'm still waiting for it. So Okay. It's a 4 minute video. So Did you get it now? No, we're not getting it. Elizabeth, you're on mute. Uh, thank you, Laura. Yvonne, do you want this? Oh, I think I have it. I got it. Okay, let me find it for you. Most people recognize his name and know that he is famous for having said something, but considering the long-lasting impact his teachings have had on the world, 
very few people know who Confucius really was, what he really said, and why. Amid the chaos of 6th century BCE China, where warring states fought endlessly among themselves for supremacy, and rulers were frequently assassinated, sometimes by their own relatives, Confucius exemplified benevolence and integrity, and through his teaching became one of China's greatest philosophers. Born to a nobleman but raised in poverty from a very young age following the untimely death of his father, Confucius developed what would become a lifelong sympathy for the suffering of the common people. Barely supporting his mother and disabled brother as a herder, an account keeper at a granary, and with other odd jobs, it was only with the help of a wealthy friend that Confucius was able to study at the royal archives, where his worldview would be formed. Though the ancient texts there were regarded by some as irrelevant relics of the past, Confucius was inspired by them. Through study and reflection, Confucius came to believe that human character is formed in the family and by education in ritual, literature, and history. A person cultivated in this way works to help others, guiding them by moral inspiration rather than brute force. To put his philosophy into practice, Confucius became an advisor to the ruler of his home state of Lu. But after another state sent Lu's ruler a troop of dancing girls as a present, and the ruler ignored his duties while enjoying the girls in private, Confucius resigned in disgust. He then spent the next few years traveling from state to state, trying to find a worthy ruler to serve, while holding fast to his principles. It wasn't easy. In accordance with his philosophy, and contrary to the practice of the time, Confucius dissuaded rulers from relying on harsh punishments and military power to govern their lands, because he believed that a good ruler inspires others to spontaneously follow him by virtue of his ethical charisma. Confucius also believed that because the love and respect we learn in the family are fundamental to all other virtues, personal duties to family sometimes supersede obligations to the state. So when one duke bragged that his subjects were so upright that a son testified against his own father when his father stole a sheep, Confucius informed the duke that genuinely upright fathers and sons protected one another. During his travels, Confucius almost starved, he was briefly imprisoned, and his life was threatened at several points, but he was not bitter. Confucius had faith that heaven had a plan for the world, and he taught that a virtuous person could always find joy in learning and music. Failing to find the ruler he sought, Confucius returned to Lu and became a teacher and philosopher so influential that he helped shape Chinese culture and we recognize his name worldwide, even today. For the disciples of Confucius, he was the living embodiment of a sage who leads others through his virtue, and they recorded his sayings, which eventually were edited into a book we know in English as the Analects. Today, millions of people worldwide adhere to the principles of Confucianism, and though the precise meaning of his words has been debated for millennia, when asked to summarize his teachings in a single phrase, Confucius himself said, Do not inflict upon others that which you yourself would not want. 2,500 years later, it's still sage advice. Thank you for doing that. And now it's Okay, so I'm back. So with that, I, I hope that was a helpful primer. <laughs> so you understand a little bit about his background. And with that, I like to ask some questions for you. Okay, for, this is a, a short little quiz. And how long ago did he live? Would you say 4,000 years ago? B, 2,500 years ago? Or C, 500 years ago? Anybody? 5,000. B. B, okay, somebody <laughs> yeah, uh, caught that. Okay, so uh, 5,000 was, uh, was not one of the choices, but yes, it's B, 2,500 years ago. Okay, so now, what was he? Now you have a choice, A, teacher, B, a government minister, C, he was poor. Which one was he? 
I hope. That's easy, all of the above. That's correct. Every yeah. one of the, you, any answer you have chosen would be correct. Okay, you, you would have understood some point of his life. And three, when he died, A, he was old, over 70 years old. B, he was rich. C, he was famous. Oh. Yes, he was just old. So he was not rich nor famous. He was even not even taken very seriously or long term employed by the many kings that he uh, served. So that is a very, I just wanted to let you know, that's the point about sometimes people don't think about that. They think that, wow, Confucius is so cool. I mean, he must have attained some kind of status or wealth or stability. No. So that's why some, um, some even critique and this is sometimes is uh, where we get this from communism that um, Confucius somehow kept people to Chinese people down, kept them away from um, modernity. And therefore, you might remember during the Cultural Revolution, Confucius statues were torn down, Confucius temples were burned. And this in 2019, when I was in Chufu, when, when I was in Chufu, China, and I visited Confucius' hometown, the tour guides told us that, that during the Cultural Revolution, people from outside of Chufu, outside of Shandong came and the Red Army that is, tore down their temples, broke all these um, statues and destroyed Confucius temples. Now why? Because, because there was politically in a, let's say, uh, unpopular with, um, with the government at that time. But Confucius, throughout the many centuries have actually overcame that. And here is where I like to make a very clear point between Confucius, the person who lived before and died in about 200, uh, two, about 500 BC, right? And then the person or the, his teachings, which we call Confucianism, that's actually passed along on to the Chinese social structure, government structure, and education system. So Confucianism Confu uh, was something that has a longer legacy. It began when the emperor, 200, 300 years after he passed away, came across his teachings. And the emperor at that time decided, wow, this this person, this philosopher really has a point here. And he started to read his beliefs and he re read his principles, his design for government. And then he did this really incredible thing. He went to Confucius gravesite and did a worship ceremony and honored him as a teacher. Because of this, this tradition passed on from emperor to emperor to all the way throughout those 2000 years that China had emperors. So, so every emperor had used something of his teachings to, to control, to create order and to make sure there was some kind of law and order in China. In the, in the kingdom of China. Now, what are some of these rules and orders? For example, before Confucius time, there was no laws, no marriage laws. Okay, so that means men who, you know, would, would love them and leave them, right? There was lots of children everywhere and nobody was protecting them or they don't even know who these kids are from. So Confucius was one of those that, his principles actually became part of the marriage laws that didn't that was in effect until 1957. Now that could tell you just one small example of the huge kind of impact that Confucius have and Confucianism maybe have on the Chinese people. Okay, now um, I will. Now I go back to my slides and I would share with you the next two points. The next two points is, is now we're going to get into more of 
So here is our little quiz. And the scope of influence. And his scope of the scope of his influence. Now, this is the best way I can attack this because it is such a big topic. Now, people have asked me, is Confucianism a religion? And I have to say, mm, not exactly the same way as Christianity, because there's no there's no Sundays and Saturdays in Chinese calendar until the 20th century when we change over to this Gregorian calendar we all have now. So it's not as, as ritualistic as we think, but it does have, oh, I would say it's a philosophy. It's a philosophy that's so embedded in Chinese language and Korean language and Japanese language is embedded in our social structure and the way people interact with each other. And so it is very much practiced beyond once a week, but then it's not really formalized into you know, sacraments or anything like that. So I would say that it's a philosophy and it's passed down through families and families and, and many, uh, it has a huge influence on East Asian um, lives that is beyond just, um, let's say Taoism or Buddhism. Now, is it, a, and then the question is, is ancestral worship part of Confucianism? And that is true. That is true because this order that Confucius uh, saw kind of became modified to this ancestral that worship that we would honor our grandparents, our ancestors, because because it makes sense to the Chinese mind that that would be the person, if they were alive, would care about whether I survive or not. So it's a very pragmatic way of thinking. But we can, I will go into that maybe a little later. Now, is Confucius treated as a deity? Now, that is a question that I often get. And I would say hmm, yes and no, because Chinese view of a deity is quite, quite different because we can can a hero, a war hero, once he died, and people who loved and honored him would would uh, revere him after his death, and they do become a uh, form of deity in the Western sense. The Chinese idea of um, gods and, and having a god or not, that is uh, that's a way bigger question that we can answer here. And then there's another question is, is Confucius like a patron saint? I, I think, yes, it's, he's like a patron saint in the sense that maybe you pray to, as they saying, Anthony, if you lost something, right? And then uh, for Confucius, we tend to think that if you're a teacher, if you're uh, in the profession of teaching, then Confucius would be the one you would pray to for getting a job or to make sure you are a good teacher, <laughs> that you must do your job that in a way that Confucius would not be ashamed of you, you see? So, and then we would have this this burden of thinking that, wow, we don't want to disappoint Confucius' beliefs or his his mantras to life. And, and what is a Confucius Institute? Now, this is a very new, and I would say um, part of communist uh, revival of Confucius. Now, you know that during the Cultural Revolution, Confucius was banned, right? And then, and then in the 1990s, now, when I was in Chufu in Confucius' hometown, the tour guide showed me how, look at all the statues are back up. Well, in the 1990s, they came back, they, as in the government, came back in the 1990s and repaired all our temples and we, um, gave us new statues and, and cemented all those um, blocks that they broke. So, so I think Confucius Institute is safe to say that it's not really Confucianism coming from the people, but it is a tool that has um, has a political ramification that's not necessarily what represents how people think. And where is Confucius uh, Confucianism now? And that's what we're going to get into. The, and that is that um, what I've noticed about China is that Confucianism is on its way back. So the scope of the Confucian influence, I would say, is that it's beyond China's borders. It involves six Chinese-speaking countries, and I would say China, Taiwan, Malaysia, 
in Singapore, Macau, and Hong Kong. And these countries where Confucian uh, philosophy is taught in school is very much part of that, um, that you must go to school. This education and learning is the only way, only way out of poverty and injustice. And any thing that you wish to accomplish, you must go to school. Now, so this is so much ingrained in these countries that schools are incredibly, incredibly competitive to the sense that you would not find it psychologically helpful here or healthy here. Um, but that's also because and students will go into school with a certain, think of it as a social contract, because they know that we have this common belief that this is what Confucius wants and I will go to school because this is, we already agreed that this is why we're here. Now that is a very different motivation to go to school than let's say going to school because you want to enjoy learning or you want to have fun. No, that's not the reason these East Asian countries and I am countries once part of Chinese empire like Korea, like Vietnam, uh, like, um, let's see, um, Thailand, I believe one section of it. So, and then main trading partners of the Silk Road like um, Japan, okay? Japan has more Confucius influence than China in its legal system. So if you find that surprising, it's not surprising at all because they really have um, put many of the Confucius principles in practice. So then uh, now we're going to start with the scope. So I just gave you a scope of how many places that his belief system is, is part of the fabric of people's lives in East Asia. Now I'm going to tell you about how long, right? This is here, I'll use that clock again. So when the emperors were established and we're not going to, I can't discuss whether, you know, emperors was a, uh, was good or not for China. Okay, all I can tell you is this. Emperors is a system of government, government that lasted for 2000 years. So whether um, in American perspective, whether that's a good or bad thing, I mean, Chinese people will not tell you good or bad thing. They don't want the emperors to come back. But the bottom line is that it's a system that lasted for 2000 years. It's a system that during its duration was the, was the height of Chinese economy, government system, inventions and technology. So whether it's good or not, and people don't, don't get me wrong, Chinese people do not want the emperors to come back, but it was a system that's very stable and uh, kind of, um, let's say, arts and um, culture and trade was definitely hugely advanced during the imperial times. And that system started about when we're looking at that 24 hour clock, if Confucius came at 1130 in the morning, the emperor started at 1pm. And once they started to um, implement some of Confucius principles, they actually found it very useful to govern the country. So imagine that Confucius didn't know he was whole, in his life. He always wanted somebody to listen to him. And guess what? Many, many emperors did. And that time ended actually about 11 p.m. at night. So that gives you, I hope, that idea of how long is 2000 years? Well, it's about 1 p.m. to 11 p.m. And we're at that 11.59 minute mark. You see, so that is how long the imperial system lasted. And this is a picture I have of um, the Confucius, um, let's see, this is the Confucius, uh, his hometown, where they show you the, the walls and the several layers of walls that go into the temple, the, the, the original Confucius temple there. And this temple is bigger than the one in Beijing. And the point of why there's so many fortress walls is also because the emperors would make a point every birthday, Confucius birthday, they would come all the way from Beijing to travel down to 
truthful with hundreds and maybe even a thousand people on entourage and they would come visit and perform a worship and formally ceremonially recognize Confucius. So they would come in this huge entourage and do a ceremony and remember him. So that's how powerful uh, that uh, Confucius was in the imperial times. And they found that he was, why did they like him so much? Well, because he really has some good ideas. So what are his big ideas? One of it is this the golden rule that you saw in the video. And the golden rule is something that you might be uh, associate with someone else <laughs> of uh, um, another god that, <laughs> that you're familiar with. But this came to the Chinese people through Confucius. So that you should not do you should not do what is unpleasant to you to someone else and then he also believed that this philosophy of humanism that means human lives are valuable that you must not be um, tempted to be corrupt to uh, uh, assassinate your um best friend because you liked his wife uh, you can, you must do something to to preserve life Okay, and so that's the philosophy of humanism that is actually more valuable than money than other properties. So for one typical story that you hear about Confucius is that in his time, in his many travels, one time he was at a kingdom where there was a fire, 3 a.m. The fire was in the stables and this king had all his prized stallions in the stable and they, and these, people, his, his servants went out there in the dark in the night, carrying water and trying to put this fire out, push, try to save the horses and threw, put out this fire and by carrying all this water. And the king said to Confucius, wake up my, you know, my, uh, my Lord, Lord, what do you know what's happened out there? And Confucius said, what? And then he said, there's a fire in the stables. And the Confucius asked, was there anyone hurt? And this is a famous line. And because the king, the owner of these horses, were thinking about his horses, of course, right? He's thinking about his stallions and his prized possessions. And here Confucius turned around his whole anger and frustration that why there's no one got hurt. And that, Confucius says, was the best news ever. You see, so that idea of human lives matter more than your prized salience, I think some of the, some people we know now might not agree, <laughs> but, but at that time it was equally shocking to the, because think about it, that time servants are not really people. I mean, if you have a huge, beautiful collection of stallions, they are far more useful than your, you know, your, your minions, right? So that king, has taken this message as a wow what a lesson learned and this is a lesson that we often learn here from confucius that we must put human lives first and this and this correctness of social order social structure that means that you must as i said take care of your minions and care take care of your servants just as much as if you do they will take care of you. It's a re re um, reciprocity of relationships in every step. And that is between um, sister and sisters and brothers and brothers as well. And this he taught was also that personal responsibility and social responsibility that if you want to advance, think within yourself. If you feel rejected by your class or rejected by your friends, Reflect and think, what did you do? Did you do something that provoked other people? And then if you could just stop and reflect your inner thoughts, then maybe that answer would be much clearer. And maybe you did nothing at all to provoke it. Okay, then you can get mad at them. Okay, but the idea is that you first start with that personal responsibility. That did you do something that 
made other people find it upsetting or did you provoke someone and then this idea of benevolence and benevolence is being kind to your each other that sense of brotherly love and how would you get there by education by if you can ever become have an opportunity to learn then you must learn and that there's no like question about it that you, there's no even uh, um any idea of going against that if there's two people there's another story that is, that confucius often said but I, I will always remember that is called three persons on a journey and that three persons is this i am a person of the one of those three and then there's two people next to me and they're both my masters masters in the sense of a teacher not a yeah, not a yeah, master servant, but masters in the sense that one person who may perform less than me, but then I think of that, maybe they have some flaw, but then I think of that flaw and think if I have those flaws and I am not tempted to do those things. And then if I have somebody, those, the other person is superior than me, then I think about how can I become like that person? So you see, this kind of thinking philosophy changes the way we channel our jealousy or our disdain for other people. We can choose to do that, or we can choose to use someone's flaws to to incorrect to encourage the correction ourselves, or choose to see someone's ability and superiority and their competence to become more like that instead of pulling uh, instead of reacting to envy and jealousy so that method which we can try to get there to be a better person is through the what we call rites and rituals and rites and rituals may not mean very much in the english speaking world but that rites and rituals means that uh, we have etiquette, we have manners and good manners. And some of that manners you'll see in Glenview, many are our uh, Korean neighbors, my Chinese neighbors, my uh, Philippine um, no neighbors exhibit. And that kind of may be that just a nodding to say hi, that's part of this Confucius manners. And we associate each other with those little uh, gestures of how we are part of this social order. So then here is a comic that I found in this book that if you're, if you are interested, please look at this. This is in a, a Confucius Speaks, it's available at Glenview Library. And this book is talks about the golden rule and how do we use that? How does that golden rule, and, he, and this is where Confucius has often uh, been cited, his teachings are in a collection, they call it the analytics, is many, my, very, very much part of the, his discussions between his disciples and him. So think about like Socrates also had disciples and they had question answer time. So this is where someone asked him, you know, what is it, let me see, I can't see, oops, sorry, okay go back I can't see the top but, uh, and so this is idea of I to click it again okay go back so what is the correct conduct for one's whole life and then he, so this is um, this is the idea that he and he has so many teachings and he he bring it down to one that says, perhaps it would be thoughtfulness, consideration. Many times it's translated as consideration for others. So what you yourself do not like, do not impose on others. And this is the way we understand the golden rule. And so Confucius saying is another one that I find is very useful and very typical is that by three methods, we may learn wisdom. First, by reflection which is the noblest, second by imitation, which is the easiest, and third by experience, which is the bitterest. And many times these three methods is parallel to our stages in life. As youths and teens, we, I mean, we want to, um, let me see, yes, by, 
by um, using things we often learn by experience <laughs> because we don't like to listen to those rules. We don't like our, you know, our parents always telling us, oh, you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't double book yourself. And, you know, you, you, uh, and these things that we can't help want to learn by experience. But then when we get to be a more adult, we learn that, hey, if we just stick with our study schedule, you know, it's not fun to, you know, to be doing our homework and catching up on notes, but I see somebody else doing it, so I'll do it too, okay? So then you you model after someone, and then the and then when we get older, <laughs> it's really when we realize that by reflecting on our actions that we can learn before we jump into a bad idea. So this is just uh, some basis that I like to share with you how I can explain to you where I got my moral center without Christianity and many people and millions of people in East Asia has also uh, gotten their um, moral centers without the Ten Commandments. It's not necessarily the same Ten Commandments, but we have something that is very much equivalent to that. And if you might have heard that in Japan and China, the crime rate is rather low for such a huge population and uh, population density. Many times they attribute it to Confucianism because, okay, that's before the whole surveillance thing. Okay, so so yes, the whole uh, you know China. You heard about the um, the cameras being everywhere, but I think even before that, the crime rate is different because of this kind of self control that many many um, Confucius thinkings been programmed into our um, raising our children. It doesn't mean that's no crime rate. Oh, there's definitely also crime, definitely, but it is a um, that you might see that your Korean or Chinese neighbors they tend to teach them children certain rules that very much conform to the Confucian principles. So I just want to recap that these four points today that I share with you, this is just the beginning and this introduction. I hope that you feel you understand this Confucius person and the Confucianism a little bit. And this is just the beginning. I just don't expect to have covered everything about him. And I hope that you will have an idea, understanding of, of something you can maybe have a conversation with starting a conversation with your with your um you know like uh, parents who have um not necessarily your neighbors but then your kid has a you know asian friend and then their parents will under would be able to have this conversation with you and it's it'll be a very nice way to begin to learn about each other So I have a final note here, and this is one last one. And this is what people ask before. And Zhang, he, you asked Confucius about serving spirits and gods, okay? Zhang Yu, yeah, Zhang Yu asked about um, serving spirits and, God, um, and gods, okay? So then he, so Confucius answers him, then say, if one doesn't yet understand how to serve people, how can one understand serving spirits and gods? So may I, so he said, may I inquire about death then? And, and Confucius said, if one doesn't yet understand life, how can one understand death? So may, some people may have asked me, and some people have asked me if, you know, we Chinese people, do you believe in afterlife? Well, you know, you burn incense and, you know, you talk to your ancestors. Are they, you know, in another life or, okay, well, yes and no. <laughs> okay. Um, I would, I'm again, um, generalizing. So I'm, I don't think that all 100% of my Chinese friends agree with me, but I would say majority, a good part, a majority of uh, Chinese people, Asian people, do not feel very far from the deceased family members, that their spirits are around us and we, we, we um, know that they're there. Okay, but most, uh, in a very concrete and pragmatic sense, Chinese people do not have a very well uh, thought, uh, um, very expanded view on afterlife. 
No, like, uh, so, so this way is the best example of how Confucius answers it. He believed that we have to know how to treat each other. We need to, you just focus on life. And then the death thing, you know, and the afterlife, that'll work itself out if you just know what you're living for. So I, so I just like to leave that thought with you, and I think that um, it, it's time for you to uh, to um, talk to me. So I will be glad to listen to your thoughts and reflections. Thank you, Yvonne. We have some questions in the chat. So when you're ready. Move this out of maybe, the way. Stop, maybe you want to stop sharing your screen. Yes, I'm trying to. Okay, it's so complicated. Little, I, yeah, I can't see the. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to. I, I love CJ's comment in the chat about, you know, isn't it great we have a technical issue, which reminds me of a couple weeks, a few months ago, we had a speaker that said, it's not a Zoom call unless we have some sort of technical issue, right? So we've gotten those out of the way. Um, okay, so. All right, so first question comes from Carol um, that was sent to me, and she wanted to know, um, her question was, just as a region has an impact, what effects has Western culture had on Asia? Oh, that's a, I, I think that's a very huge question that I don't know if I can answer in the scope of my presentation, because Western uh, westernization has been going on since 18th century, okay, when uh, trade, because, okay, now even further than that, the Silk Road has, was, has been active, well, was active for 2,000 years. So there's always been Western more, you know, contact with uh, China. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, an easier question from Carol. Yes, maybe it's, something um, shorter. Sure. Did did Confucius ever marry? Yes, he had children, and I mean, he, he had. That's also why in his hometown, there uh, majority of the people there uh, last name is Kong. Okay, so there's a uh, there's a uh, yeah, it's a very well populated town. In fact, uh, one of the um, things you can do at Confucius home, there's a Confucius home, uh, his home estate, and where they would have. Um, books where you can look up your your Kong ancestry. There's people who, Kong is a rather so-called small last name in China, Chinese culture. So people have, um, can trace, like I have a cousin who can trace back that he is the, you know, 70th um, generation from Kong family. And then people, um, and the funny thing about that is in China, if you go to the Confucius home estate that's a is a attraction they you don't have to pay for entrance if you are a con so if you can show proof that your passport or your um id your last name is con then you are have a free entrance so there there are millions of them but not not as many as other last names and then we have a question that's in the chat um, from Tom and Karen, um, wants to know where you were born and what is your religion. So we want to know more about you, Yvonne. And then, our, and then the majority religion in China. Do you know that today? Okay, so first I would say, I, I'll try to handle this one at a time. Where I was born. I was born in Taiwan. I came to America when I was eight. And we lived a year in New Jersey. And then we also lived in, most of my life I lived in Los Angeles. My parents came from China. They were both separately. Bef uh, and uh, one, my father was probably 17 and my mother was nine when they left China. So they were not from Taiwan. They were not, we are not indigenous Taiwanese. And uh, uh, let's see, so, and now next question, do you say something the about- is, uh, What's the majority religion in- majority. Uh, Oh, wow, that is kind of a difficult number to to give you uh, because first of all officially china is atheist right the communism says that it's atheist so there's no religion <laughs> okay but um but i i can tell you that is that's not true 
Okay, they and um, so officially there's no religion in China, but uh, there are Confucius temples, there are Buddhist temples, there's Taoist temples. And, the la and since the 1990s, Confucius temples have been, as I say, repaired, restored. Uh, Buddhist temples have become yeah, widened and um, expanded. So now they are, you can send busloads of people you know, to park and there are convention centers around Buddhist temples. So, so that can tell you that there are people who definitely um, practice or worship either regularly uh, or um, once every few years. So it's definitely popular to have a um, a place to worship, if that helps you understand, you know, religion and whether there, what is a religion in China. Thank you. That was good. There's a lot. I'm. I. I think I've got my China bug back. I want to learn more and go there, which, <laughs> which will be hard right now. Um, Peter, did that answer your question? I know you put a similar sort of question in the in the chat. Uh, well, my question was more uh, regards to the uh, Xi Jinping, the current premier and evidently future premier of China. Uh, certainly doesn't uh, like anybody except the Communist Party. Uh, and my understanding is that these religious temples are regarded more as museums by the communists. Oh, yes, there's no. Yeah. OK, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Uh, whether museums or attractions, they call it attraction, like a sightseeing. OK, so I think they perceive it as a threat. Any, any kind of religion is a threat. Um, so I'm just curious, I, I, I'm not trying to, I mean, is that how you perceive it too, that they perceive it as a, a threat more than... Uh, oh, okay, I thought you mean if I perceive no, no, yeah, no, them as a threat. Okay, I, well, I can, okay. well, I, mm, I think that in a, yeah, authoritarian government, there is no really option to do anything outside of what you're permitted to do. So first of all, um, whether it's a threat or not, and uh, it's not going to be officially discussed as a threat. Okay, but if you're allowed to go, then you go. Okay, so people don't try to go and they know the, the parameters of how much you're allowed to um, to uh, show their enjoyment or their involvement with it, let's say that. And the temples and that are existing now, the Taoist temples or um, like I mentioned, Buddhist temples, the people who are working there, even though they look like monks, they have, um, they, they're paid a salary. They work there from nine to five and then they, they go home. So it's not a, the, it's not what you think, what we would think of the traditional like temples. There are monks who live there all the time. They're there to um, they are there like a, um, to, let's say, their scribes or they're there for the temple's sake and they're there for religious education, right? In China, the people you see at temples, they just work there and they are, they don't sleep there. They are there as an employee of the attraction. So does that help you? I hope that helps you understand what it means. So there, so even the abbots or the lamas that do their chants and um, ceremonial services, and um, um, they are kind of like um, invited to perform. Hmm. So you're so if you're invited to perform, you perform. But if you that invitation can be rescinded any time. So. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that. That's, yeah. that's so, Thank yeah. You. So that is something that you know that I found interesting too in my visit, you know, in China. That I thought they, you know, they were real monks and real, you know, uh, I guess part of the religious order, but no, they're not. Thank you. Mm. Are there any other questions for us, CJ? If you can kind of help me scan, that would be great. Thank you. 
and Confucius, I can tell you that Confucianism is um, encouraging a way. I mean, the, so what I mean is like whatever you're allowed to do, people will do it because they're allowed to do it. It's much better than during the Cultural Revolution. During the Cultural Revolution, you bow to your grandfather, you go to jail. Okay, there's so many things that is very scary. I mean, you are a, you are a puppeteer, you know, marionettes, and you go to jail because you're 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 um, spreading culture in some wrongful way, right? So, so that's why now the Chinese people are kind of thrilled to be able to see visit Confucius temples again, see Confucius being, um, you know, the statues are erected or returned to university campuses. People, um, so so when when does um, when do people visit Confucius temples? Well right before uh, final exams, college entrance exams, you'll, they, the schools will take students and busloads go to Confucius Temple and pray for good grades. So that is part of this um, activity that you're allowed to do and people love it. Okay, so, so before we go into kind of like, oh, you know, they're not allowed to do this, not allowed to do that. Well, many times I see people having a great time. They come to the temple, you know, they get to, they, um, they bring gifts to Confucius and they, they, um, they form lines and they make sure that they're in a proper etiquette and give their dues to, to, you know, to the sage and honor him. So it's a, it's really a happy thing. Mm -hmm. You won't go out? Um, that we, <laughs> that little interruption brings us to another question, Ivan, which is, are there any underground Christian movements or churches in China right now that you can talk about, speak to? No, no I, I can't tell you. I, I, I don't know enough about that. Okay. Actually, I, yeah. actually, I can, I can answer this question. Oh, yes. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you. Hi. Yeah, I just had the chat with a friend two days or two nights ago. Her uh, friend went from here back to Shanghai. And then um, that friend went back to Shanghai, uh, uh, attended a church that's like 100 people, but they go very secretly. They go to some um, unidentifiable type of shopping mall some like big room, they do uh, worship or Bible study. And then within one or two weeks, they change to different location. It is pretty dangerous to this way, but they, um, they um, purposely, they went to shopping mall because mm -hmm. shopping mall always have a lot of people. It's not easy to, to be, uh, say, oh, this group is too big to, to um, do Bible study or do uh, uh, Christianity related activity. So, it is still like the atmosphere to practice religion, um, uh, Christian, or um, it's a little bit still very, very restricted. And then yesterday I talked to another friend who said a lot of them um, church went online because of uh, limitation of uh, the size of a church. And also they cannot dump us economic downturn also cannot make a, each um, church to pay for their rent. So they all went online. So that is the situation in China now, in Beijing. Hmm. Thank you. And Thank you. you jump in with, and, and take care of that question for me. Well, I do know there are, I don't know if anybody knows this, but there is a Jewish tradition. I mean, there's Jewish community in China too, Kaifeng. They, they've been there for like 500 years. So recently, there are some articles also about the Kaifeng people who are of Jewish descent and they have secretly practiced Judaism in, for many hundreds of years. And even in the last um, <clears throat> couple of years or so, they were they, uh, a group of them went to Israel and was received very kindly by, by the, the Jewish people there. So there are definitely a variety of religious groups or communities, but how far they can, you know, have religious uh, so-called 
freedom is is nothing that we can understand from the United States perspective. Thank you. That's the I'm learning more and more. We have another question. Um, since several concepts of Jesus, the teacher seems similar to Confucius. Is there any indication that Jesus knew the teachings of Confucius? I I can't answer that question either. But I but it is very curious that you know during that time where you don't think there's much traveling <laughs> that far apart, they would have similar. Um, very revolutionary belief system. So definitely a um, very new concept you know, for that time. If I might insert. Okay. Yeah. Jesus had the golden rule and Confucius to separate it. His is called the silver rule by some experts. The difference is the golden rule says do it to others as you would have them do unto you. The silver one says don't do something mean to somebody if you don't want them to be mean to you, there's a <clears throat> there's a subtle difference. Thank you. And I think the two are either coincidentally or by design connected. I think they I think he was influenced by Confucius in mm. some way. I just that's just my intuition. Thank you. Um, and Thank you. Ivan. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Oh, they're coming in quick. Um, okay, first one is why is this is from Laura? Why is there disagreement over the precise meaning of the teaching of Confucius? Is it a matter of language differences, evolution, or a matter of different rec records of the same yeah. teachings? That's a very well, um, yeah, deep question. So, why is there a disagreement over the precise <laughs> meaning of the teaching of Confucius? Confucius, now he taught many lessons, right? I can say that it's also like, well, throughout history, there are some lessons emphasized more than others. And there have been definitely true reinterpretations of his ideas. So I had, um, for example, um, some of the, yeah, some discussion have been the place of women. Okay, some people feel like, well, you know, there's all these Confucius um, notes, uh, you know, in the analog that he did not feel women should be educated. Okay, but guess what? Those happen not to be the ones that are emphasized in our last 200 years, <laughs> or I mean, 20th century to 21st century. Okay, in the sense that if you see the, um, in Taiwan, where I came from, the, uh, be in the 1980s, okay, there was already more chi uh, women-owned businesses or women CEOs than in a percentage of population, I mean, okay, than compared to China even now. So I don't think it's because that, let's say, communism, say people often attribute communism as uh, what brought women to be more equal standing with um, China, but I think that's kind of, a, again, limited way of seeing um, Chinese population. Thank you. Um, and second, another question is how much of Confucian philosophy or Confucius's philosophy do you think is embedded in the communist education systems? Wow, these are some big questions. Yes, and, and <laughs> I can't really, um, and maybe that's a question for Sarah because I, it's okay. really hard to know if I didn't go to an education system there. Okay, uh, and also I think that again, by popularity, you know, by, you know, look at American education, you know, in the time I came to America to now, there's different lessons that are being emphasized. I think that's the same as for Confucius, but I definitely think that Confucius teaching is coming back since the 1990s compared to the 1990s, because when I traveled there, we saw all sorts of, you know, these um, slogans that used to be, you know, communist slogans or um, or one child policy slogans. Now we've seen like driving by highways, driving by, you know, just government buildings, pub, you know, big places where there's billboards and it's Confucius things. It's saying like, be kind to your neighbor, um, you know, be you know, the golden rule. Just all these Confucius quotes or proverbs and I, I took pictures because I was so surprised. I didn't think I would see that, but it is at train stations. So I definitely think that bringing Confucian, Confucianism back definitely creates order 
in Chinese society. It connects the Chinese people with what they know. And it's better than hiring more police. Honestly, that's really what they, you know, his purpose is for, right? So I hope that, I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. Okay, then we have another question from CJ. When East Asian people are teaching their kids about etiquette and manners, are they actually talking about Confucius okay. and using his name? Yes. Uh, or just share, or should I, do you see it? Should I keep going? Oh, no, go ahead. You should okay. read it out loud for everyone in case okay. somebody doesn't have their chat okay. on. About, all. all right, thank you. About Confucius and using his name or just sharing his teachings. Another way of asking, do you think about Confucius when you are making conscious decisions? So, so whether um, East Asian people are consciously aware that they are passing on Confucius teachings, this is a good question. Many times I believe, and again, you know, this is, I'm speaking for like a majority, what I see, many times is so embedded in the culture that we're not even aware of which one sayings are from Confucius, when, which one's from Zhuangzi, which one's from Laozi, which one's for, from Mencius. Okay, these are all different Chinese philosophers. Many, and I think that it's just so much passed down to us that it's in the language, it's in our proverbs, it's in our uh, idioms, expressions, that many times I don't think East Asian people or Chinese people are consciously aware, but they're definitely there. There are sometimes their parents who are aware and they will emphasize it, but I don't think it's something that everybody goes around mentioning his name, let's say. Okay. If you think about comparison of something comparable is like, um, there's so many Shakespearean quotes, right? Like all oh, life is a stage. And sometimes people will say something they didn't even know is Shakespeare. So uh, let's say, um, let's see, um, let's see, you know, some of the Faulkner title of the books, right, are, are Confucius, no, not Confucius, <laughs> uh, they're Shakespeare quotes, but then some people don't, you know, and some of them were just not that as aware of it. Does that help? Does that, yeah, I hope that that analogy helps people to connect to what Confucius means to, um, to East Asian people. I think so, thank you. Are there any other questions from folks? So again, I yeah, I hope this is just, yeah, we're just, just beginning a conversation. I love these questions that we're, we're actually trying to understand each other. Um, so let's say, let's say when we teach our children to give, like we give you tea with both hands and and they're supposed to receive with both hands, right? We just tell them that it's good manners to do that, but whether it's come from Confucius directly, it's part of that practice of what makes ritual, make, what ritualistically makes us more kinder and gentler to each other. Manners is ritual, but I like that a lot. I like that a lot. Thank you. And and as to, and I guess I will add one more thing is that as you have probably seen that you know China has become more wealthy and you see skyscrapers all over Shanghai, you see that the quality of life, standard of life, is rising dramatically over 20, 30, 40 years. I would be very much I very much believe that as people become more affluent, and they come to America, they go to Europe. When they go home, they don't say, oh, I want to be just like the Westerners. Now, when they go home, they feel like, wow, I want to learn more about Confucius. I want to know where I come from. I like to practice those things that what makes us Chinese. And that's only going to become more popular, you see, when people can afford it, let's say. You see, like, because that's what we saw in Japan and Taiwan and Singapore, when the quality of life gets better and they can own a home, they, even if it's an apartment, they want to practice tea ceremonies. They want to get married in a red dress, not a white one. You see, those things comes with the when you feel you want to, now I can afford it. I want to be more of who I am not what the 
you know, wearing a Western tie means, you see? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Thank that's you. just uh, my, yeah, my, um, my insight. Yeah, it's good. They're good insights. Well, I just want to thank everyone from, for being here. I know we had a lot of new and old friends join us late. So if you want to um, we first thank Yvonne again for all of her hard work in putting together this presentation. I learned a whole bunch and remembered a whole bunch. Um, and if you want to learn more about our speakers forum or our church, you can find us on the website at, at www.gccucc.org. Maybe uh, CJ, you can put in the in the chat um, if you don't have it. And then also you'll be able to find the recording there. And, and we will also make sure to get you any of the handouts or things Yvonne shared tonight, because I know people like to go back and review their handouts um, that they've seen. I know that's the case for many of the folks here. So thank you again for being here. I really appreciate it. And we will see you guys next time. Thank, Thank you. you very much. It's a pleasure being here, being part of a Glenview community. 